Welcome to Mineral Springs. We're glad you're here. If you're new with us, please introduce yourself to Pastor Jason or Pastor Patrick. If you're joining us online, please leave a comment and say hi. Now, here are some announcements. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who helped yesterday getting the boxes ready. But now it's time to pack them. In fact, there are probably some folks down there right now packing shoe boxes. But we will, after service, after Sunday school, go down, finish up whatever's left, get it ready to go out around the world for the gospel of Jesus. Then I want you to know we have a meal planned for 5.30 tonight. Come back, we'll be tired, but we're gonna have a Christmas feast. We're gonna celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus here at Christmas in July. It'll be a great time. Wear something red or green and we'll just have a party celebrating Jesus. Then on the 28th at 5 p.m., there's a kids ministry, back to school event, big back to school event, July the 28th five o'clock. Then we're not finished with Christmas in July. We come up on July 30th, the evening service at six o'clock, our Singspiration. We're gonna have some special guests come and then we're gonna have a Christmas Singspiration. We're gonna bring Christmas treats. You bring yours, I'll bring something and we'll have a big party afterwards. Good morning, Mellow Springs. Would you please stand and worship with us morning as we sing Blessed Be Your Name. Give and take 
Morning, church. This morning's scripture reading is the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John Alexander and all who were of the highly priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved.
praise you for you are holy. We praise you for your glorious name, for your son which you sent to die on the cross and rise again for our salvation. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us this morning to participate in the Christmas child boxes, for these boxes to go out to proclaim your gospel and your glory to the nations. Lord, we pray for those kids at those boxes, um, whose, that their hands will grab one of those boxes, Lord, that they will be able to read, understand your word, that they will come to saving faith in Jesus, Lord. We thank you for Brother Nelson. We thank you for the ministry that you have blessed him with. And Lord, we pray for Brother Jason as he brings this message this morning that you will speak through him and speak to our hearts to better understand you, your glory, and the gift you have given us, which is your written word. Yes. God, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 I think there's some folks downstairs finishing up the last bit of the shoe boxes. They've been working hard. We started working yesterday, and we are privileged to have Brother Nelson Randolph here with us. And he's going to come in just a moment and tell a little bit about the ministry. I hope you tell him everything you said in the first service, brother. That was beautiful um, because it was a wonderful just explanation of what God is doing through him and through our church and our partnership with Brother Nelson and Operation Christmas Child because we want to reach the nations for Jesus. Amen? We want people to be saved and to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our goal, and we want to use every means necessary. So Brother Nelson's going to come, brother, and you share with us. And then after that, there's a short video we're going to see. Good morning. <clears throat> I guess I'm going to have to get a bigger truck because I don't think we've ever finished 2,000 shoeboxes by the beginning of the second service. When I came upstairs a few minutes ago, we were done, and they were consolidating the items to get ready to put back in my truck to take to Pennsylvania. I'm very thankful for your church and all of you uh, for the finances that you provide. Last year we built, uh, and I truly don't know how it happened, but we built more shoeboxes than any year before. We built 44,885. And your church helped with 4,500 of those 44,885. So you did, as we say in West Virginia, just a Nats eyelash above 10% 10, 10 of <clears throat> all the boxes, you know, that we build. And that's just incredible when you think that 40% of those will go through the greatest journey, you know, the Vacation Bible School class, and roughly 20%, or one out of every five, will pray to receive Christ. Um, just sometimes it's hard for me to wrap my arms around. So I'm always looking for items on the cheap. Cheap is good. Things on sale, you know, giveaway prices, those kinds of things. But free is better. And for 15 years, I've got items from a company called Raymond Gettys. And if you've been downstairs, those little Dr. Seuss cards, the drone eraser, the crayons, and there's a couple other items that are down there on the table that came from Raymond Gettys. And I never bought items from Raymond Gettys at full price. They always had two or three times a year a special sale, and then it's a long story, but I ended up always going to their warehouse, which wasn't far from my house, maybe an hour and a half drive, and I did that purposely to get to know the people at the company and so they could understand what I do and, and would send them an email every now and then with a picture of their stuff, you know, on a table, you know, being put in a shoebox. And this year I was in at my sister's in January and I got an email from the manager of the warehouse that said, every year we prepare a donation list and he said, we've decided that we're going to give you first choice of that donation list. And so I was kind of excited and kept checking my email every day. And one day, I finally got this email, and it had an Excel spreadsheet attached. And you know what that is. It's just a big list of all the items, and it told how many there were, and what the retail price was, and all that stuff. <clears throat> so I went over that list with a fine-tooth comb and lined off uh, 19 items, I think, and I, there were 27 out of the 46 that I could use. So about a week later, I was at the Raymond Gettys warehouse 
walked into my friend's office and said, here's that list that you sent me, and the lined off ones I, I can't use, I'm really sorry, but thank you, but I can use the others. And he said, Nelson, I'll, I'll call the forklift guy and we'll have that all pulled for you out of inventory, and I'll know in a day or two how much it is, and then we'll talk about you coming to pick it up or, or whatever. So the next day he called me and he said, Nelson, we have, oh no, I'm sorry, I missed a part. <clears throat> so I said to him, you're gonna give me all 27 items. And he said, all 27. And I said, and all, cause I had looked across to like column G and looked at the quantity on some of the things and it was a lot. Like those erasers that were at the end of the line, there were like 350,000 of those or 400 or some insane number. He said, Nelson, we're giving you all of them, all of them. And the next day he called and said, we have it all put together on the dock. It's 52 pallets. <clears throat> and I said, 52 pallets? I'm gonna have to get a tractor trailer, you know, to come and pick it up. So I called a friend from church that has a small trucking company. And I said, I'd much rather hire you to go pick that up than somebody I don't know. And the next day he called me and said, it's on its way and we don't want any payment whatsoever. So I did the math on the retail column and it came out to over $300,000 worth of items. $300,000, isn't that great? So um, before we show the video, I have a couple prayer requests. The last couple years I've had some health issues, but I think all of us as we get into the 60s and 70s and beyond, we all have what I call, refer to as senior issues, but I was in the ER two or three weeks ago and had a nice young PA and he fixed me right up and, and I'm good to go. But I'll be 68 in October and I think I have, I think, I have five to seven more years at least of shoebox building to go. I'm still shooting for 500,000 before I quit, and if things go well this year, we should bump right up against 400,000. We're somewhere over 350,000 um, right now. So that's one prayer request for my wife and I. And then you've heard me talk about the warehouse that God has blessed me with. It's an old Dixie Cup building in, a, in not a good part of town. It's about, I think, 750,000 square feet but I have maybe 30,000 square feet on a ground level. I have two docks, a forklift, so I can receive like those 52 pallets from Raymond Geddes and I can send shoe boxes out. And for all of that, I don't even pay the electric. It's $250 a month. And I've been there for 10 years and the building is sold. And the last conversation I had with the owner was January. So, Unless they change their mind, I'll have to be out by January. So I've had one church that offered to uh, let me put a pole building on their property, which is an option. And I've looked at a couple other buildings, but I'm going to need to do something. So if you would pray that if there's a Christian brother or sister that has some space that they want to allow me to use for three to five years for a small amount of money, that would just be wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. So I'm going to show this video, and it's kind of a tearjerker, but it's, it's excellent, really good. marginalized so I took them in for them to be educated like other kids it's the love it's a pure love from my heart when you have that love and you see them being abused because of their hard of hearing sometimes the parents do not understand they don't see as these kids are like other kids 
So that's why I have that patient to take them in. They are all the same. They are all equal. They should know. For them to know that Jesus loved them, and for them to know God deeper, for them to spread the gospel to others. I started here today with the shoe boxes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. The, what we do with these shoe boxes, this is a vehicle. It's a vehicle to provide an opportunity for the gospel. And God has used it and blessed it, and we pray that he will continue to all over the world. And thank you for the part that you have played, Mineral Springs. Amen. Get your Bibles, take them out, or turn your attention to the screen as we look at Revelation chapter 1. Our focus this morning is going to be verse 19 and understanding how we can know that we can trust God's Word. That God's Word is trustworthy, it is true, it is something that we don't need to add to, it's something we don't take away from, because it is the Word of God the Holy Scriptures, the Bible. And we're going to see, as we look in Revelation, that 12 times the Apostle John is commanded to write. He's commanded to write, to write down what he has seen, to record what he has seen faithfully, so that God would preserve it for you and for me, dear one so that we could have God's Word some 2,000 years after the Apostle John was here on this earth, that God has preserved His Holy Word for us, and we're going to see how important that is. Two verses, the Bible says, Write therefore, write therefore the things that you have seen, 
those that are and those that are to take place after this. And so just to, to look at that briefly, there's a question, you know, what is John talking about? Well, the commandment to him is to write, to record, and there are a couple of things to record. Those things that are, that have happened, or that are happening, and those things that will take place in the future. There are those who are called preterists. That means they believe that all of Revelation has already taken place. Uh, some who would not be in the camp to believe the Scripture is divine, that, that John kind of recorded after everything that happened, tried to make it look like he was prophesying. We don't believe that. Amen? We don't believe that at all. No, we believe that there are those things in Revelation, as the Lord Jesus says here, that have already occurred. But there are also those that are to take place after this, that have not yet taken place. Verse 20 we've looked at in other studies where Jesus explains the mystery of the seven churches. He says, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So let's go to our Lord together in a time of prayer. Great Heavenly Father, it is in the name of Jesus that we come to you this morning. And oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you are good. We thank you, Lord, that we get to have the opportunity to be a part of what you are doing, not only here in America, in Virginia, but across the world. Lord, thank you for our partnership with Brother Nelson, for Operation Christmas Child, for Franklin Graham, and all of those involved with that ministry. We pray, Lord, that you would use what we are doing to save souls, to have lives and eternities changed. And Lord, we ask now that all that we say, all that we do is for your glory. That we, Lord, would go out of here today encouraged and have a new, fresh, heartfelt belief in the, the sacredness of your word. Lord, that we can go out knowing that you have spoken to us, that you love us, that you care for us, and you have preserved your word for us, that we'd be on fire for Jesus. In his holy name we pray. Everybody say together, amen, amen. Three points this morning, dear ones, off of this verse. Number one, God preserves God's word for God's people. Let me say that again. God preserves God's word for God's people. The way that you can know that the Bible is true, the way that you can understand that there is a God who has spoken, is by taking the very simplest notion. If you are here today, if you're listening today, and you don't believe that there were two crazy atoms and they just collided together, that there was some primordial soup that was out and some wind blew, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, there's the first spark of life, and then by billions and billions and billions of years of magic, all of a sudden, then here we are. If you haven't bought into that lie, and you understand that there is a God who made all that is, from the smallest life to, to us. He's created everything. He's made the beauty that we see on each other's faces. He's made this building. He's made this world, the trees that go, the ocean, air, the sun, the moon, the stars. Everything that exists, God made it all. You saw the little boy on the video who cannot hear with his physical ears, but who has been taught that he knows God made creation, God made the birds. God. It's not some accident. It's not some false deity who, who did this or did that. It is God Almighty who made everything. Amen. If you believe that, then it should not be hard for you to believe that the same God who created all the universe has the ability to preserve his word 
to give his word to chosen prophets, to chosen men of old, to write down his word and to hold it and to keep it for you in the 21st century. So in other words, if there is a God, and he does exist, which there is, and he does, then we should not hesitate to believe his holy word. And dear ones, we're going to see this morning, that's exactly what John has been instructed to do for my good and for your good all throughout Revelation. We're going to see a dozen times where John is commanded to write. We back up and see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, we're here. The Bible tells us he is commanded, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. Seven is a number that comes up often in Revelation. It represents unity, perfectness. It represents completeness. The seven churches stand for the universal church. They were seven real churches, but they stand for the universal church of God throughout the ages. Our verse this morning, verse 19 He is commanded, write therefore the things that you have seen. Then when we enter into chapter 2 and following, we see that throughout the book, John is commanded to write, to write, to put down what he has seen. 2-1, to the church in Ephesus, write. Smyrna, write. Verse 12, to Pergamum, write. Verse 18 of chapter 2, the church in Thyatira, write again and again and again. He is commanded to write. Chapter 3, verse 1, to the church in Sardis, write. The church in Philadelphia, write. The church in Laodicea, in 314, write. And so again and again and again, John is commanded to write to these churches which we know represent for us the entirety of the church of God throughout the ages. So he is commanded to write. How did we get the Bible? God inspired. God showed his his people, his men, to write down his holy word. But also, we see in the book of Revelation, chapter 10 and verse 4, John was about to write, He was about to do what he was commanded to do, and he's told, stop. Revelation 10, 4 says, And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. In other words, church, not everything has been revealed to us. God still has his mystery that he has sealed up from the seven thunders, and it will be in his time when he so chooses to reveal that to us. I don't believe that will happen until after we all get to heaven. But then we not only see the command to write to the churches, but we also see in Revelation 14, 13, the command to write blessings, that God has commanded his uh, apostle, his prophet, to write this blessing. He says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. What's the blessing? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. There was a blessing. Remember, revelation has been given to the church much in part to encourage those who are going through suffering and Christian persecution. Now, for you and me, we have endured very very little Christian persecution, right? Right? I mean, there might be some of us who somebody's made fun of us. Maybe you got made fun of in school. Maybe people poked fun at you because you didn't go along with the crowd and do things. We might get made fun of and might be disliked by the world today, but they haven't come knocking at our doors to take us away. They haven't tried to come in to break into our services. They tried to keep us from having service recently. That was a test to see what can we get away with. But we have been blessed to undergo very, very little persecution. I've told the story before when I was in India, and we were going from house to house trying to witness. 
And as we were going, I stick out like a sore thumb wherever I go. My wife says, oh, I gotta, all I got to do in the crowd is look for that red head and, and see, you know, so she can see me in the crowd. Well, I stuck out in India as well. And as I'm going through this village, my translator, who's very uh, aware, very understanding of what was going on, he says, there are police officers following us. I said, what? He said, there are plain co- close police officers following us. They've been to the last three places we've been, and I've noticed them. We need to get out of here. It's illegal to witness in India. It's illegal to proselytize in India. And so we were in a house. We were talking to a man who claimed he was Muslim, but yet he was also Hindu, and it's just a weird conglomeration of beliefs. And as we did... All of a sudden, there was a surprise inspection by the police in that house. Why? Well, Big Whitey was there. That's why. That's what was going on. They could tell me from everybody else, so they said, okay, let's go see. And so they come into the house. I went right up to them, to both the cops. I shook their hands. I said, hi, my name's Jason. I've never been to India. What's your name? And they went, oh, they didn't know what to say. They spoke something in Hindi. I didn't understand what they were saying. I said, man, I love this country. It's a beautiful country. We're leaving. Good to see you. And I went with the translator. We just went out the door, and he looked at me. He said, how did you do that? I said, I just left. Let's go. <laughs> That's the closest thing to persecution I've ever undergone. They were coming there because they knew I was there. They were coming there. They know. They're, they're thinking, what's going on? They didn't want Christians in their village. And we, I didn't want to jeopardize the rest of the ministry and the mission for those who had been there, so we skirted out. But John says here that for those from that point on who died in the Lord, they were, they were blessed. Why? Blessed indeed, because they rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. In the time of persecution, do we fold to the culture? No. Do we give in to what the culture says we should do? No. Do we give in to what the government says we should do? Not if it contradicts what the Lord Jesus tells us to do. Amen? I was hoping it was going to be stronger than that. That's better. Chapter 19 and verse 9. We're also given another blessing. A blessing about an invitation. And isn't it great to be invited? Isn't it great to be wanted to come somewhere, right? Well, Revelation 19.9, the angel said to John, write this. What is he to write? Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. I've told this story too, a very sad story. I pre- was preaching a revival service. Uh, my friend's church where he, or he was the pastor, and it was a Christian church, and as... Uh, I was going out after preaching. I met several of the people, and a young man came up, and he just had a a sad look on his face. He had been in ministry, and he had been in a Baptist church, apparently, and he and his uh, pastor, he was an associate pastor, they got in a fight, and I know this isn't the whole story, but I said, "Well, well, what happened? Why aren't you at that church any longer? And he said, the reason is because we had a disagreement over theology. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, what's it going to be over? And he said, it was over who was invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, I believe that all Christians were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Which I believe that's correct, just in case you're asking. He said, but my pastor believed it was only the baptized bride, only those who were baptized um, in, in the Baptist way, only those would be the ones who would be able to attend the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't see baptism in this. I don't know where he got it. I think he made it up, quite honestly. But it severed their relationship. So this young man was no longer in ministry because of this disagreement about theology. That's not the point here, dear ones. What's the point? The point is there is a great invitation. God's going to throw a party like there's never been a party before. Amen? It's a celebration. It's going to be big. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be better than any party you've ever been to. It's going to be bigger than any celebration you've ever had. It's going to be the biggest thing you have ever, ever seen. And God calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, look, 
You need to write down that these people who are invited, those who trust in Jesus, those who know Christ, they're invited to this party. They're invited to this supper. And not only are they invited, but you need to write it down because these are the true words of God. John reiterates that part of the connection of the invitation is that this is God's word. What you have the ability to do, dear Christian, is you have the God-given ability to talk to people and to give them an invitation. You don't have to have a sermon. You don't have to sing Just As I Am or I Surrender All or any of those songs. You can just tell them, here's the gospel. Jesus died for sinners. He's raised from the dead. You're a sinner. And if you trust in Jesus, you can have eternal life. Your past can be forgiven. Your future can be forgiven. And you can go on to be with God in heaven. Now, here's your invitation. What do you do with it? Dear ones, the word of God claims the word of God is true. And he says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are blessed today because we know Jesus Christ. Thirdly, another blessing that we see uh, that is a promise of what God says and he commands John to write is in Revelation 21 and verse 5. We see him seated on the throne, the Lord God Almighty, and he says, He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. I tell you what, the older I get, the better that sounds. What about you? Amen? I mean, like, listen, everything's going to be new. God is going to make everything new. You know, I'm on, I'm probably past half my life already. Um, I had a midlife crisis. I got over it because I got over the midlife. Um, I'm not in the middle anymore. I'm on the other side of it. It's all downhill from here. All right, let's just say that. Yeah, that's good to think about. <laughs> age is something when you start to get a little bit of age on you, you notice things about your body. Body doesn't work the way you want it to. Not able to do things like I'm able to do anymore. I've gained some weight. Rick, back behind the uh, baptistry there, we're working one day and working on that baptistry the last time. And I got up on that thing and I've jumped down from that thing I don't know how many times. This time I jumped for something. The ground was harder when I hit. <laughs> and, and things that you'll wake up and things ache, things hurt, have things wrong with us physically. There's cancers, there's problems, there's, there's things that go on with our bodies. We don't like it, we don't want it. Now the young people here, they don't understand anything about it, okay? Maybe you've had a headache before, that, that, you can deal with that. Listen, God says, he says, write down this, everything is going to be new. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. There's going to be new buildings that God makes. There's going to be a new city in which we live. But we're going to have new bodies. We're going to have bodies that don't grow old. Isn't that good news? We're going to have bodies that, hey man, we can, we're going to eat and feast at the party, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's called a supper. There's going to be food. I don't know what he's going to serve, but it's going to be great. And all this is promised to us in Jesus. And he says, write it down. Write it down, for these words are, watch, trustworthy and true. You can trust God's Word. God's Word is true. He has preserved the God who made the universe. The God who, I tell you this, I don't know, some of you know this, some of you don't. I went to the University of Kentucky, and I studied. I got a degree in mathematics, but I, I went in, I said, I want to do the hardest thing I can do, and I, I got a, uh, enrolled in the School of Physics. I said, I want to get a physics degree. I want to do this. Um, had the government send to me things. Hey, you can start out with this salary to do work for this job. I'm like, oh, should I do that? And I didn't work for the government. So I decided to work for the Lord instead. It's been much better, trust me. And in physics class, time after time, they would do this thing. You know what they would do? They would dangle a carrot. You know what that means? You know, there's a law on the books, one of the states, you may know it, if you know it, shout it out, where it's illegal to, wear, to have an ice cream comb in your back pocket. You know why? Horse thieves. 
The horse thieves would put an ice cream cone in their back pocket. That horse would taste that ice cream. Boy, it was good. He would put it in his back pocket, and he would walk, and the horse would follow him. I didn't steal that horse, Ossifer. The horse just followed me home. And what they would do to horses, as you've seen in the cartoons, they put a carrot out just out of reach of the horse, so the horse would, would go and try to get to that carrot. Well, in physics, the carrot was, once you get to quantum, it's all going to make sense. All your, all your problems are going to go away. All the things are going to be solved. Now, I'll tell you this. Uh, I was not the sharpest tool in the physics shed, Okay. I thought I was smart in high school, and then I got with some of these kids. One kid, bless his heart, his hair grew out sideways. His brain was going so strong. I didn't understand it. And we got in class together, and I thought, man, these guys. One had one professor. He went around. He said, how many A's are going to be? How many B's? How many C's? How many F's? I started looking at who was in class. I said, yeah, I'm going to drop this class. I, had no, I, I, I knew who the other kids were. I knew how powerful their brain cells would go, and I knew I wasn't in that group. They kept promising us when we got to quantum physics, it would explain these problems that we had set up years and years prior. Well, I'm proud to say God gave me the blessing. I got to quantum physics, and I actually not only did I get through quantum physics, but I passed. I didn't get an A. I didn't get a B. I think I got a C. But I passed quantum physics. And do you know what they didn't do? They did not answer the questions they said they would answer. It was just another carrot. It was just another promise that was broken. They didn't explain the matrices that we were using to find out and solve these problems. It didn't explain all the things that we had, had our questions about. It was just another carrot. And dear ones, at that point, I, I, if I had doubts about the Word of God, God used that class to let me know science doesn't have the answers. If you're here this morning, you think, well, science, it, it knows, and, and it shows, and it, and it works, and it's, it's better than the Bible. I'm going to tell you this, science is changing. They say, trust the science, which one? Because it's always changing, it's always in flux, but God's word is steady, God's word is trustworthy, God's word is true, because, number two, God's word is forever. God's word lasts forever. There'll be a time for you and me when we're gone, we're gone from this old world, all of our clothing, all of our houses, all of our vehicles, all the things we've stored up, it'll be gone. But God's word will remain Look at this. Look at what our Lord Jesus says. The one who commands John to write it down says this in Matthew, in Mark, and in Luke. All three Gospels, heaven and earth, will pass away. But my words, Jesus says, will not pass away. This old world one day is going to be done away with. And he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Aren't you excited about that? He's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be like we're in the Garden of Eden again, except we won't have the temptation any longer. We're going to have great things that God is going to give us and provide for us. It's going to be more beautiful than we could imagine. It's going to be more luxurious than we could think about. I mean, we're going to be able to work with God. We're going to be able to do what God commands us to do and have just an awesome time, better than anything that our hearts could ever even come up with. And we will still have the Word of God. God's word then will be complete in our hearts. So I want to encourage you this morning. Listen, don't be ashamed of God's word. D don't let the world, don't let the devil, don't let the culture. We, we live in a crazy culture today. Amen? Listen, that we, we live in a culture where pretending is the biggest thing right now, Right? You're going to pretend you're a stuffed animal. You're going to pretend you're a cat. You're going to pretend you're a boy when you're a girl, and vice versa, and all this, this insanity. Listen, don't be ashamed of the truth of God. What's the worst they're going to do to you? Make fun of you? Fire you? Hey, God's going to provide something better. Jesus says in Matthew 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... 
in this adulterous and sinful generation. You think we have it bad. Jesus says of him, will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Don't be ashamed of God's word. Don't back away from God's word. Don't back down from believing the truth of God's word. God's word is forever. He said it, it will be. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, forevermore. Number three, not only is God's word forever, but God's word, dear one, is powerful. There is power in the word of God. We had an opportunity this past Wednesday to host uh, the Gideons. We have a special relationship with the Gideons here at Mineral Springs, and some of you were there. The Gideons sent a, a man who came from Nepal, and he told his testimony. He told how God changed his life. He was a Maoist terrorist. Maoism, familiar with it, it's what basically is being pushed down the throats and into the heads of our teens, of anyone who's following this woke culture. It's the same deal, okay? It's communism. It's the idea of basically make one group of super elite people who, who pray on, I mean, uh, pay for all the things of everybody else. Did you get that sarcasm in there? A little bit, some of you did, but the others are like, they pray for, no, the, oh, okay. He said he was a Maoist. He was, he was a teacher. He was teaching this philosophy. And there was a, a young lady in his class. It was grade eight. And it's not like our eighth grade. I don't know how their grade works. But she, she brought him a little New Testament. And it was a Gideon New Testament. And she said, I want to give this to you. It talks about some of the things that we've been talking about. Something like that. And he took that Gideon Testament. And he began to read. And he said, I don't understand this. He started in the Gospel of Matthew. And it was the genealogy of Jesus. What does this mean? What does this mean? And she said, why don't you come to my church with me? And maybe they, could under, maybe they could explain it a little bit better than I can. And he went to church with her. And he got saved. And he left Maoism. He said before that, he believed in his heart that salvation came from a gun. This is how we will have our salvation, with our gun. He said, I, I, would, I would say that salvation comes from gun. And then he said, Jesus saved me. And now I know salvation comes from Christ alone. Amen. And God worked in his heart, and it, the story went on. I didn't even tell him this in the first service. He ended up marrying that girl, and he showed a picture of him and her and his daughter and how the Lord worked. And now he's traveling with the Gideons uh, across the world to tell people about the importance of giving out God's powerful word. That's why we support that ministry. Revelation 1.19 John is commanded to write what he has seen. He is commanded to write the things that he has seen, the things that have taken place and the things that will take place in order to preserve it for you so that when you read it, God's Holy Spirit works in your heart. Hebrews chapter 4.12 says this about the Word of God. It says the Word of God is living and active. Well, how can a word be living? What do you mean? It means that when you, as a saved person, read the Scripture, when you read the Bible, God's Holy Spirit begins to work in you. God's Holy Spirit begins to teach you. If you are in sin, He will convict you. He will show you things you don't need to do and show you things you need to do. It, it, it convicts us of forgiveness. It convicts us of the things that we're to do, to witness, to get the Word of God out, to do what the Lord has called us to do. And it says not only is it living and active, but it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sharper than any man-made weapon. Razor sharp. Listen. Piercing the division of soul and of spirit. And of joints and of marrow, and doing what? Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Dear ones, God's Word shows us who we are. And that's scary. It's scary to look into the mirror of God's Word and see why we do what we do. 
And yet God says, I will give you my word to show you that so I can shape you to be like my son. Who is his son? Revelation 19, 13 tells us Jesus is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. Now this is no surprise to us if we've read John's gospel. John refers to Jesus as the Word of God. How precious is the Word of God? His God's name. How precious is Jesus? He's God's Word. John chapter 1. In the beginning, in the beginning was what? The Word. And the Word was with God. Okay, you have God, you have His Word, and the Word was God. Whoa, what? God not only is in the beginning, but this Word is God. He is. He's a person. He's not an it. He's not a thing. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus says of himself in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Amen. Here's the good news about me, about when I get to heaven. You know what's going to happen? I'm not going to come into judgment, but I'm going to pass from light, from death to life. You see that? That's you too, dear one. If you know Jesus, you've trusted him. I'm not going to be judged for my sins. I'm going to give an account to the Lord, yes, but I'm not going to be judged for them. Or I'll tell you where I'd be. I'd be in the devil's hell. That's exactly where I'd be. But God says, no, he's going to not judge me and pass me into judgment. But because of his grace, he's going to give me the gift of heaven and eternal life. Now, how do we tell people about this? We tell them about it by getting them to his word. The attack on the Bible has been the devil's greatest scheme in American history to get us away from God. You just look at when they took scripture out of schools and you look at what's going on in schools now where they are literally putting litter boxes in some schools because of the insanity that is going on in the minds of the teenagers. Dear ones, it's sad because they've taken away the word of God. Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Isaiah the prophet made it, made it very clear. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 10. He says, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there. You never, if you ever see rain going up, you're upside down. Free advice, that's not even in the notes. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the flower and bread to the eater. How the rain provides growth for the crops. God says, look, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void or empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The man that took over for Moses had a big pair of sandals to, feel, to fill. The Bible lets us know in Joshua chapter 1, God used Joshua and he used him to encourage the people. Moses, their leader had died. They would complain about Moses, but they all looked to Moses. And then he was gone. He was dead. Joshua says, only be strong and very courageous. Being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. And then he says this in verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. Think about it. Talk about it. Day and night. Why? So that you may be careful to do, listen, according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Here's the commandment. Have I not commanded you? What's the command? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Don't worry. Don't be scared of what's before you. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever 
you go. That's what the Word of God teaches His people. He's with you. He's going to be with you. He's not going to leave you. Romans 15, 4, the Apostle Paul says, the things that were written in former days, they were written for your, our instruction, our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Whatever you're facing, dear one, today, because of the power of God's Word, you can have hope. Whatever you think tomorrow may bring, here's, here's good news. There's hope in the Lord. There's hope in His Word. He will sustain you. He will keep you. He will never let you go. The God who made the universe and all within it is perfectly capable of preserving His holy, perfect, inerrant, complete Word for you to give you hope. Remember, dear ones, three points. Number one, God preserves God's Word for God's people. He has and He will. Secondly, God's Word is forever. And thirdly, God's Word is powerful. My hope for you today is you have His Word in your heart, that you look to His Word to eat that spiritual food, to grow in faith and knowledge of Jesus, to give you hope and encouragement for the days ahead. Amen. Father, we thank You. Oh, Lord, we praise You for Your Word. God, most of us here today, if not all of us, have grown up with immediate access where we can go at any time, almost anywhere, we can have your word. Lord, we thank you for that privilege. We pray, Lord, that we would treasure your word, that we would love your word, that we would look to your word, and that you, God, through your word, would strengthen us, that you would give us that hope that we just heard about, Lord, you know what's going on in every life here this morning. I don't, Father, but you know every single situation. You know every problem, every pain, every circumstance. Lord, I know there's a family here struggling, dealing with death. I know there's a family here, Lord, they're struggling, they're dealing with, with health issues. And God, you know every problem we have. Lord, we lay it before you. We need your help and we look to you. We pray, God, you strengthen us. Encourage us, Lord, with your word. In Jesus' powerful and precious name, we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand and worship with us? Oh
the Lord. God is good. Well, I just saw they finished everything downstairs, so they packed all the boxes. Praise the Lord. But you were invited, you were invited to come back tonight at 530 for a big Christmas feast. Ham, turkey, all the fixings. And if you would like to bring a dessert, you don't have to, but if you'd like to bring a dessert, some people have asked, what can we do? You can bring a dessert. That would be good. And we will share that, but all of the meal portion is taken care of. Let me just see a raise of hands. Who thinks they will be here tonight, Lord willing? Can I give them a number? All right, good, good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's good. We're going to enjoy that time together, church. Love you. God bless you. Um, we won't have service tonight. We'll meet downstairs in the Fellowship Hall at 530, and that'll be our service. I've asked Brother Wade. He's... a uh, Pat, uh, Taylor, not Patrick, Taylor's dad to close us in prayer if he would come and love you. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We love you. We honor you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that the pastors of this house that brought. We thank you that they preach your word, Lord. We just thank you and honor you for, for sending Jesus to be the Savior of mankind. Lord, we praise you in good times, and Lord, may we praise you even louder during the bad times, because we also know that you, you are the God of restoring everything broken, Lord. We just ask you to prepare our hearts and our minds from this word to go forth and do your will, to go share the gospel, 
just like the example of the eighth grader to our teacher, Lord, just give us that faith to go and share your word to the world. In your great and precious name, we pray to Jesus. Amen. We are so glad that you have joined us today, and we would love to meet you in person. If you are local to the Vinton area, you are invited to our Sunday morning worship services, 8.45, 11 a.m., and 6 p.m. each week. Also, if you are not local here, we would love to help you find a Bible-believing, Christ-preaching church in your area. Message us, and we will do some of the lead work behind the scenes to find one of those churches to suggest for you to attend.